Welcome back, welcome back. Well, in case you hadn't noticed, it's the movie awards season and the run-up to the Oscars. I'm joined now by one of this year's main contenders, the award-winning Mexican film director Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu. His latest film, Beautiful, has been nominated, despite its, it's misspelled, isn't it, the word beautiful, but never mind, anyway, nominated for two Academy Awards, Best Foreign Language Film and Best Actor for Javier Bardem. Iñárritu's breakthrough happened over 10 years ago with his debut film, Amores Peros, which was also nominated for Best Foreign Language Film and followed by the internationally acclaimed films 21 Grams and Babel. Alejandro is here with me now. But first, let's take a look at Beautiful. In this clip, the father, who's dying of cancer, is giving final gifts to his two children. <laughs> Why is death rather than life, death, such a theme? Everybody asks the question, I'm sure. Such a theme of your films, going back to the death trilogy at the beginning, etc. Since, since I was a kid, I, I have been very obsessed by death. Just the thought of it really excites me. Um, intellectual, yeah. Intellectual. I think yeah. intellectual is uh, the most exciting thought. I think nobody has returned to tell us exactly what it is, and that's the biggest question mm. of human beings mm. since the, the man exists, I guess. So it excites me intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, challenge me. It's a struggle all time, and I think that affects the way you live, the way you perceive things. And I, 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 I try that my films are not films about death, because I love life, but it's about life being observed through death. I mean, I put the camera in the final line. So when you observe life at the end of the life, at the end of the road, I think life is just different. It, that's the case of beautiful life, I, I guess. Do you believe that there is an afterlife? Do you believe that you will be enjoying one in 60 years time, let's say. Sometimes I would like to believe, sometimes I would like not to believe. Mm. I, I, I did a lot of research for make this film and one of the guys that really, one of, a woman that was very impressive, he, she told me, Alejandro, you know, death is just the beginning of a long and painful road. And I said, really? <laughs> I thought that yeah. life was already a very intense journey. I said, no, people think that is the end. It's just the beginning of a but very long it, I was like, but, but, <laughs> but you have to be an atheist, presumably, to think it's a long and painful road. If you're a Christian or a believer, you presumably think it's the beginning of a long and joyous road. Exactly. But I think that depends on where you are at your life. That's what I'm yeah. saying, that intellectually as an idea, the death is just an idea. We don't know what it is. So the idea is changed depending on our circumstances. That's what is fascinating, you know. I think it depends in many things. So that's why it's a battle all the time for me that I would like to believe in one way. I would like, and that's why I, I was privileged to explore this theme in a film and make a film about that. That, that was fantastic for me, I have to say. Do you prepare for death? Well, I think that as we have to learn how to live, I think we have to learn a little bit how to be prepared for that moment that is inevitable. And I think that one thing that I'm sure about it is that Western cultures in the United States, they are thanatophobic. They, they, they are phobic to thanatos. They don't want to talk about that. It's almost like a taboo. And they reject that. They, they take out death as part of the conversation, as part of life. And I think that as we integrate death as a way that we will be, as, a, as part of the life, we will be happier. I think to think that the illusion to strip death from our thought, it will make us happier, is not true. Because, because I think when you know that uh, something will be finite, then you enjoy it more, you appreciate it more, and you don't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Animals are the only, I will say, life creatures that are immortals. 
be because they don't know that they will die, but we know that we will die, and that gives us an advantage to because we can bite and enjoy life because we know that it will finish. And that, I think, makes people feel and life, live life much more plenty. Right. That, that's but, what I think. And talking of the subject of death in another context, I mean, one of the reasons you had to leave Mexico, what, 10 years ago or whatever, uh, was in fact the violence and in, in a sense the danger of death, the danger yeah. of being killed there because of the high level of murders connected with drugs and other things. I mean, so that you really had to go, didn't you? Yeah. It, I it wasn't a casual decision, it was saving your life. Yeah, I, I will not put it as dramatically, right. but I have to say that once I did Amores Perros, I become a very uh, identify public figure, kind of a nice target for kidnapping that at that time was yeah. getting really nasty. And I have two young kids, and I was not really feeling safe and comfortable. And creatively, I have to be honest, too, there was an opportunity for me to put myself in an uh, uncomfortable zone. Uh, which I like to do creatively, yeah. to not be comfortable and be Mr. Gonzalez yeah. in Arito in Mexico and doing films there. So it was a challenge artistically, and at the same time, I had to move out because I felt safer, you know? And, uh, you know, things are getting tougher now. My country is a beautiful country uh, with a strong cultural heritage and beautiful people and resources, but the, the lack of opportunity, so, so many young people and lack of education has created a very cows that mm. is so you couldn't really conceive at least in the foreseeable future of going back to live in Mexico for the danger and for the other reasons I, I will love because I, I I miss my country is just that uh, I feel that now my country is kidnapping this spiral of violence out of control but I would love to return to Mexico it's not a as you said it's not a nice decision for anybody to leave their country you don't leave that every immigrant won't, it comes from the same from pain it's a painful decision. It can be political, religious, lack of opportunities or insecurity, but it's, it's not a nice. I love my country. I really love my country. And, you, and you've been defending it just recently uh, because of a very popular program, British program, but seen around the world, uh, Top Gear, um, said things about Mexico with which you did not concur. It's just embarrassing. I think for me, the fact of those guys, you know, just to have three guys talking about cars and have that kind of rating for me is just already, you know, shocking. But to take an opportunity to use that to, to, to celebrate ignorance, this Berlusconian way of making television to, sh to provoke, to insult, and celebrating the ignorance, it's just shocking. And uh, I, I was thinking to myself, what will, be hap what will happen if these three idiots, if these three ignorants, has done that or expressed that against Jews, for example, to say, imagine how depressed to be a Jew, and being a Jew and say, oh my God, I'm a Jew. Or what if they do that joke with the Muslims or with the black community? It will be a scandal. You know what I mean? So to make fun about the weakness of a country when we are going through that, it, I think, and, and, and again, showing the ignorance and this uh, in the name of entertainment, you can create these atrocities. That, I mean, what I'm worried about is not because Mexicans, we are above that. It's just the, 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 the cultural genocide, that is stupidity being exposed to millions of people, is just uh, unacceptable, I think. Well, just as a surprise to you, coming through the door now is the host of the show, Jeremy Clarkson. No, it's not. I will, I will punch. I will have my gun. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. And uh, it's, a pleasure. it's a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, we wish you all the best in, uh, in Los Angeles. I really appreciate and it. that will be another bit of good news for Mexico. I, I, will, I will love to. I will yeah. love to. I will love to bring it's, that good news. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you very much, David. Leaders across Europe have been denouncing the once sacred policies of multiculturalism. First, Switzerland banned the building of minarets, then France bans the burqa. Next, Angela Merkel, uh, and then David Cameron, state multiculturalism has failed in their countries. 
While more and more immigrants arrive on the continent, our European government is becoming more and more hostile. Joining me today is Morten Messerschmidt, member of the European Parliament of the Danish People's Party, and Mary Hassan, senior editor of the New Statesman magazine, and a self-proclaimed product of multiculturalism here in Britain. Well, let, let, let's begin with uh, you, Morten, in Denmark. Um, do you think that uh, multiculturalism is failing or has failed in its mission? Well, in the sense that all cultures and values that come to Denmark or Europe should be treated uh, equally. And in, in that original sense that uh, we need to respect anything which is proclaimed as being uh, uh, cu culturally reasoned, yes, I think that multiculturalism has, uh, has uh, failed. But we have to face the reality that Europe has for centuries been uh, been having and containing uh, minorities, religious minorities, who have lived uh, door by door with uh, with other people without any problems. The problems we are facing today are only due to a huge amount of people coming with a less integrational potential than we used to see in the in the past. And it's it's in that respect that the multiculturalistic idea is failing. And uh, what what countries would you cite there as ones as ones that are coming into Europe with less um, supportive baggage. Well, it's evident that those coming from the from the very um, Islamist countries in the in the Middle East, people coming from uh, uh, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and others, come with a entirely different perspective of life than those we have uh, been welcoming earlier on. And there we see, uh, in, in a variation of terms, that there is a uh, much more difficult task to fulfill in order to integrate them and embracing them in our society that we have been facing earlier on. Thank you. Come, we'll come back to you again in a moment. Uh, Mary, your reaction to that? Your self-confessed product of multiculturalism, mm -hmm. do you think multiculturalism in Europe has worked? The problem is multiculturalism, depending on how you define it, and there's a great debate about what are we talking about with multiculturalism. Uh, I would argue that a lot of countries in Europe haven't really tried multiculturalism to say it's failed. The Germans say multiculturalism has failed. I'm not, I don't remember Germany really trying it. Ask the uh, Germans of Turkish descent how integrated they were, uh, they were made to be feel by the German government or German authorities over the years. Uh, here in Britain, for example, you know, there's been a lot of talk about multiculturalism failing, but what are these policies that have failed? We are a multicultural society. Europe has long been a multicultural continent, not just in terms of immigrants, but in terms of the different cultures that exist within the European culture. We're not a monocultural continent. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what's, what's failed. What's the definitions we're talking about? There is a history of immigrants coming to this continent having trouble integrating, being demonized by far-right parties, and then eventually integrating, and the next, set of, the next wave of immigrants arrive, and they face exactly the same pressures uh, and experiences. That's the tragedy of the history of this continent. You said on one occasion, Morton, that it is my firm belief, this is contrary to what Mary has just said, it is my firm belief that we now must demand for the Muslims in Europe to take their stand. Either you are with democracy or you are against it. There can be no middle way, and if you define yourself by being against democracy, by supporting Sharia legislation, for instance, the European continent should not be your home. Well, uh, my, my response to that would be twofold. One is, uh, again, it's a straw man argument. The idea, it starts from the premise that Muslims don't accept democracy, which is ludicrous in this, in, across Europe. And it also starts from the premise that Muslims are somehow a problem for the great European continent. Do you know what the Muslim population of Europe is? 5%. Are you saying that 5% of the population pose a threat to everyone? And as for democracy, I'm sorry, but I, I can't take lessons from the far right in democracy. The history of Europe, European democracy, has been blighted by far right parties from Germany to Italy to Spain. Morton, your turn. Your turn coming in. I was quoting you there. Uh, but your response now to what Mary's been saying. Well, I think it's a shame that we don't agree that uh, regardless of how and where, then people who don't acknowledge and who don't embrace the rule of law, the democracy, equality of the sexes, and the freedom of speech, and all these matters that we, co that we define as the very fundamental values of our civilization, that those simply don't belong in Europe. There are plenty of alternative countries if they want to, if, if they want to live uh, in, in Iran or other places where they can, that, where they can have, have it their way. I think they, we need to make it very they? clear that people 
people are welcome in Europe, but they can, the, the, the immigrants who are coming, I think they're very welcome in Europe, but we cannot question the fundamental values of our civilization, Who's doing which that? is democracy. When, when? So if you want to live in a, well, well, we have, I, I, I'm aware, I, I guess that you must be aware of what's going on in other countries than in, 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 in Britain, especially uh, listening to your condemnation of my party. Um, in Denmark, for instance, we have had demonstrations here uh, against the, the very fundamental principle of somebody using their right to freedom of speech. We have people here advocating against rule of law, advocating in favor of Sharia, in favor of violence, against democracy. All right. These people simply don't belong in Europe. There are plenty of other countries where they could have a life just their way. But we must just remain on our road, which is a road of freedom and democracy. But David, why are we accept I'm not, I'm not they? accepting the terms that are set on this debate by the far right. Uh, I don't accept that there's a, a huge number of people who want Sharia law. But let's look at, let's look at Britain, British Muslims, 1.8 British Muslims. Gallup polling shows that Britain British Muslims are more likely to identify with the UK than non-Muslim Britons. They are more likely to want to live in mixed areas than segregated areas than non-Muslim Britons. There is this myth being peddled by the alarmists on the far right across Europe that Muslims are taking over the continent and creating Sharia law and they're coming to get you. It's the same language that was used about minorities in the past. It was the same language used about Jews in the 1920s and 30s. Every minority community goes through this demonization and scaremongering. Instead of dealing with the financial and economic problems across this continent caused by the banks, caused by deregulation, it's much easier for far-right parties like the Danish People's Party to say it's all the fault of these immigrants, it's all the fault of these minorities who want to wear the burqa. Do you know how many people wear the burqa in France, David? 2,000 women out of 2 million French Muslim women. So this is the kind of scaremongering and alarmism that is created by parties like the Danish People's Party. Morton says I don't live in Denmark. I don't. But I do know, for example, that the United Nations condemned the Danish People's Party for referring to the Somali, for comparing the Somali community in Denmark to paedophiles. So this is not just about religion. This is not just about integration this is about uh, electioneering this is about alarmism this is about the typical tactics of the far right when it comes to any minority community it just happens to be the muslims these days back back to you morton i mean I think are you creating are you creating a monster yes. that doesn't exist I think it's a shame to listen to your uh, to, to the professor uh, in your studio uh, that is trying to to speak this problem uh, down or to 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 minimize it. First of all, I'm not, this is not. First of all, I'm not a far right politician. Secondly, this is not an issue which is only being dealt with by so-called far right organizations. We have uh, Angela Merkel, we have Sarkozy, we have Cameron, we even have socialist movements from out in at least my country and other countries in Europe who are actually talking openly about this as a problem. Problem. It is not to say that just because you are Muslim, you are a problem. Of course not. I have many Muslim friends, many people who come <laughs> from, from, from other countries Classic. who should be welcome, who have integrated. That's not the issue here. The issue here is that those among the Muslim populations who wish to abolish democracy, who are in favor of Sharia and all these matters, these we simply have to face and say, you are in your perfect only right to have these opinions, you're, but they do not belong you're being in disingenuous. Europe. We, knew, we do have to def. You, you've described but Muslims in general. You don't not, even know me. You How have can you be so insinuating? Have you, you've described Muslims in general as a burden on Europe, have you not? In an interview with Front Page magazine, you described no, Muslims as a burden I'm, on I Europe. Not listening. Islamists, not extremists. You described Muslims, all, all 20 million of us in this continent, as a burden. Back to you, what I'm stressing here is that we have been in Europe for thanks for centuries. We have been welcoming migrants here. We have Jews here who are, by the way, now uh, forced to flee the country due to Islamists who are who are harassing them. We have uh, welcomed Chinese people, Indians, people from all over the world, and that has not forced any problems. None of these has told have told the Danish society that it needed to be changed. Now suddenly we are faced with a new minority group that are telling us that we need to change our way of life that we need to change our society, that women shall not have equal rights with men, that we shall not be able to speak as freely as we used to, that democracy is not as good as, good as uh, a way of life as Sharia law. This is an entirely new situation which we have not seen earlier on with other migration groups. You cannot just simply close your eyes and say that this is only the far right talking about this. This is the reality. The average population of Europe is actually uh, realizing these changes of their society and obviously people are reacting as are Sarkozy, Merkel and any other sane politician in Europe. 
You talk about freedom of speech. I'm in favor of freedom of speech, as are most people. What they're not in favor of, they're not in favor of hate speech. They're not in favor of defamation. For example, in December, David, uh, a member of Morton's party was prosecuted in Denmark uh, for referring to Muslims as people who rape their children. He was, de he was prosecuted in a court of law in Denmark. So when Morton comes here and says, I believe in freedom of speech, of course he just believes in freedom of speech. But it's not the kind of speech most Europeans want to listen to. And I think it doesn't help integration. If Morton and people like Morton care about integration, then we should actually be finding what we have in common. We shouldn't be scaremongering. We shouldn't be hysterical. We should actually recognize, as Morton says, that Europe's been welcoming groups for, his for centuries, for decades. Europe is a multicultural continent. So why throw the baby out with the bathwater? If there are a few extremists, if there are people who have extreme views, who have violent attitudes, let's deal with them. Let's not generalize and pretend all 20 million m Muslims in Europe, 5% of the population, are either A, extreme, or B, on the verge of taking over the continent. And let's not just discriminate on one particular group. Morton gets very upset, for example, about halal meat in Denmark, but I don't see him getting upset about kosher meat. We allow Jewish communities uh, to kill animals in a kosher way as part of their cultural religious practices. But if Muslims do it, it's the end of the world. Europe's coming to an end. This is a kind of crazy rhetoric we hear from the far right and the Danish People's Party. Crazy rhetoric and such phrases. Are you thinking of a situation which is getting worse or better? It's a good sign that uh, more and more politicians are now beginning to address this problem, are beginning to, 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 to stress it very clearly that we don't want to compromise our fundamental values. I think that's a very good sign because that's the first step in order to change our migration laws so that we only attract those who are actually uh, of a, a, a integrational potential, those who will feel welcome and therefore be welcomed by the European, uh, by the European well, countries. Already here. We need to Come have to me. a much more updated you carry on. And, and uh, you're welcome. I mean, uh, I, have, I would never uh, use the same language against you, sir, as you have used against uh, me, because That's I simply true. don't your know party, you. Your party so, referred to uh, Somalis as pedophiles who were condemned by the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racism last summer, were they not? The Danish listen, People's Party was listen, condemned by the United Nations gladly, uh, Committee on the Elimination of Racism for referring to it's Somalis simply, as pedophiles. It's simply not that never happened. True. I mean, am I making that up? <laughs> speak about speak about speak about throwing lies around and generalizing. I think you take the price, sir. But if I may uh, just refer to the question that I was asked, yes, it's a very good thing. I think people are waking up around Europe, stressing that we cannot uh, just welcome any culture and any value, or any point of view which is justified by referring to religion or tradition or whatever. We need to be critical in order to perceive the. The, the, the way of life, which is the European, European one. And I'm glad and I welcome that uh, even the, the, the great leaders of the bigger countries now are facing this and challenging it. A last word from you, Maddie. On David, just to return to your original question about multiculturalism, I do believe this is about looking forward, not backwards. I think people like Morton are looking back to some imagined past. I live in the 21st century. I believe in multiculturalism because I have multiple identities and I hold them quite comfortably. Morton lives in the 21st century. Well, then the 21st century century in which I can be British, I can be European, I can be English, I can be Muslim, I can be of Indian origin. I can hold all those identities comfortably without having some crisis uh, of existence or identity at the same time. And I believe that multicultural societies help you hold such multiple identities and help us all get along much better. Thank you both. Morton, thank you very much indeed. This is a very important subject, of course, and it is thank one you. to which we will return again, hopefully with, with both of you very much involved. Thank, thank you. you both very much indeed. And that's it for this programme. My thanks, of course, to all our guests, and do join me again for the next Frost Over the World. For now, goodbye.